This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Great to be back here. Uh, I see some familiar faces and uh, quite a few new faces too. Uh, as Lori said, uh, it's been nine years. It's hard to believe nine or ten years since I've I've came here. I've been up many times before to see other speakers, but uh, it's all it's great to see you. Thank you all for attending tonight. I appreciate it. So as Lori mentioned, um, I'm an associate professor at the University of South Florida, and uh, I did my postdoctoral fellowship there. I have been researching. Uh, different methods to achieve uh, therapeutic ketosis. Can you all hear me okay? I wanna make sure it's loud enough, yeah. So uh, I started uh, my postdoctoral fellowship in 2004, uh, but prior to that, I was uh, also studying extreme environments in the context of hypoxia, which is low oxygen. And my postdoctoral fellowship was uh, the proposal was through the Office of Navy Research to understand and mitigate oxygen toxicity seizures. So this is a limitation for Navy SEAL diving. It's also a limitation for hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which has 15 different approved uh, FDA approved applications. So uh, our work is done at University of South Florida, hyperbaric biomedical research lab, and we also have a metabolic medicine research lab. And uh, I do a number of projects in partnership with IHMC. Uh, my university uh, has me disclose you know, a number of things, including our research support. Uh, the things I'll be talking about today are uh, tied to therapeutically and scientifically to a number of USF patents. Uh, and patent royalties do come back to me and they support a lot of the research, some of the research that we do in the lab. I consult for a number of different companies that develop uh, various technologies that help us uh, advance the science and the application of metabolic therapies, including ketogenic therapies. Uh, we have, I'm an owner of a company from consulting. I also co-host uh, a Metabolic Link podcast. So over the last uh, year or two, we've developed a Metabolic Link podcast and also a co-host for the Metabolic Health Summit, which was in Clearwater, Florida, and we had over 600 attendees for that. So everything that I'm talking about today, do not, please do not take it as medical or nutrition advice. So uh, I wanna give a little bit of background and context of what I'll be talking about. Um, in 2023, about six months ago, I gave a talk at IHMC in Pensacola, and that, that talk was really focused on uh, ex some extreme environments, but also ketones, mostly focusing on the neuroscience and uh, the neuroprotective aspects of therapeutic ketosis, especially in the context of supplemental ketosis. And uh, that talk, or you can reference that talk if you're really interested in neurological effects of ketones. And I did talk a little bit about the proven and emerging applications of therapeutic ketosis. Um, but today, I really want to talk about things that are actionable. So you guys, I want, I want you guys to come out of this lecture with information that you can uh, use tomorrow uh, that's very actionable. So I'll be talking about different methods for achieving, sustaining, and also monitoring therapeutic ketosis or dietary ketosis. And there's different levels of ketosis and many different applications that I will highlight. In addition to that, I think it's really important for us to take our health into our own hands. And so we can be, so we, we can advocate for, uh, for self-monitoring. So there's a lot of things that you could do at home in regards to monitoring cardiometabolic biomarkers to assess your response to different dietary therapies and your overall metabolic health. Your longevity and your health span will be tightly linked to your overall metabolic health. And I have worked with at least a dozen of the leading scientists and practitioners in the world to identify specific biomarkers that we should be monitoring. And these are not biomarkers that are traditionally part of your yearly exam that you would have at the doctor's. So I'm excited to sort of highlight some of these biomarkers. Uh, some of them you're familiar with, a few you may not be familiar with. And of course, I have references and resources at the end of my talk. And if anyone wants a copy of my talk, uh, feel free to email me and I'll send you a PDF copy of the lectures today. But briefly, I just wanna highlight some of the work that I talked about like nine years ago 
which was really, uh, we studied extreme environments from the context of the mitochondria inside the cell that, that are the powerhouse of the cell. They have so many different functions, but uh, in my early work as a postdoctoral fellow, uh, I developed various technologies that allowed us to understand the cellular and molecular mechanisms of oxygen toxicity. And then I realized that many of these metabolic mechanisms and signaling pathways are intimately linked to other neurological diseases, including you know, epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and even cancer. So our lab actually took another direction, which I think I talked about in about nine years ago, on the metabolic theory of cancer. And that project is very active. We have uh, a number of different graduate students, postdocs, and research associates working with the Moffitt Cancer Center to move that science into clinical application. And I don't have much time to talk about it here, but I just wanted to highlight that. So uh, I've studied oxygen toxicity and neuroprotective effects of ketones in mitochondria, in brain slices, and in animal models where we were actually able to, uh, let me see, oops, sorry. We were actually able to test a ketone ester and it had a neuroprotective anti-seizure effect that was greater than any other anti-epileptic drug that had been used uh, at the time. So, so the idea was then to develop um, metabolites that our body makes and to basically administer these metabolites acutely before a simulated Navy dive, Navy SEAL dive. And in the process of doing that through uh, a series of studies that we published, we showed that this remarkable anti-seizure neuroprotective effects. So that was, you know, over 10 years ago, we published that. And I'm really excited to, to just say we've published a lot since then on different formulations of exogenous ketones and the neuroprotective effects. And I understand that Dr. Morley Stone was a speaker a month or two ago, and he also talked about the neuroprotective effects of ketones, in particular uh, a ketone ester uh, for traumatic brain injury. Uh, so uh, we will, I'll highlight a little bit of that in regards to the neuroprotection effects. So we did a lot of the work in cells, animals, and we moved it to human studies. And I was a participant at NASA's Extreme Environment Mission Operations, where, as did Dawn Kernagas, a former IHMC employee, lived underwater for nine to 10 days. My wife was also on uh, Nemo mission number 23. I was mission number 22. And I think Dawn Kernagas, who gave a talk here on Nemo, was mission number 21. So I lived in a hyperbaric environment and actually looked, monitored my ketones and lived in a state of ketosis. And we have a lot of data from that. Some of it we've published, some of it we have not published. But I think an important aspect of this talk is that we've moved the rat studies, we've published multiple studies in animal models and in rats, and we've moved that to human clinical trials at Duke University. And the, the PI for that is Dr. Bruce Derrick, uh, they have an amazing facility there, uh, environmental facility, and we are, they're doing studies pretty much every day. They put subjects inside a hyperbaric chamber where they are uh, navigating uh, uh, various cognitive tasks, they're exercising, uh, they're taking blood that's going outside the chamber, it's being analyzed, and these studies are done uh, in the absence and the presence of being in ketosis. So that includes dietary ketosis, and also, more recently, uh, supplemental ketosis, which is acutely administered prior to them uh, being put inside the chamber, and then they are pressurized to the point where they have a simulated oxygen toxicity seizure. So we can measure brain activity and actually predict an impending seizure before it happens through EEG. So there's exciting data that's coming out of that. So it took about 10 years to move <laughs> the animal model studies into human clinical trials. And I think 10 years ago, I might have had this slide because it was so, such a seminal study that motivated me and many people in the lab uh, and many other investigators that study uh, fasting and therapeutic ketosis and the, uh, the role that ketones play in brain energy metabolism. So this study was done by Oliver Owen, his name's not showing up, but also Dr. George Cahill uh, at Harvard Medical School in the mid-1960s. And prior to 1967, it was thought that the brain could only use glucose as an energy source. 
So we did a series of studies that could not be replicated today because it would be unethical, because they fasted subjects for 40 days. So these subjects were overweight, so they completely <laughs> deprived them of food. They gave them water and some electrolytes, but no calories for 40 days. So uh, in the process of doing that, their glucose levels dropped, but it, it stayed you know, about three millimolar, which is you know, low but steady. Our body has the ability to make glucose if we're not eating sugar and not eating carbohydrates. So that's a really important point when I talk about low-carb diets and ketogenic diets, that your body can safely regulate. There's very powerful homeostatic mechanisms that maintain our blood glucose, so you're not going to go hypoglycemic under rare situations that happens, but it's very rare. But the important point is that after about seven days to 10 days, the blood levels of ketones are elevated such that they, are, they get above the level of glucose uh, in circulation and also in the brain. And after about seven to 10 days of fasting, ketones provide more than half of our brain energy needs. So whatever's in the blood, it freely crosses over what's called the blood-brain barrier, and your, body, your brain can use this as a source of energy. So prior to like 1967, this was completely unknown. So they had to rewrite essentially the textbooks. And an extension of the study and another group they studied, they administered the hormone insulin. So insulin is used by type 1 diabetics to, uh, when you eat carbohydrates, your body cannot use the sugar unless you have insulin available. So a type 1 diabetic needs to inject insulin for that glucose to work. But if you are a normal, healthy person and you inject 20 IUs of insulin, that is essentially like giving a... Uh, essentially a lethal dose. It would be like a lethal injection, right? But the, these subjects that were in this particular study after 40 days of fasting, and there was another study, believe it or not, that actually had subjects study uh, fast for 60 days. They administered insulin, and uh, let me see if the pointer here works. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, okay. They administered insulin, and they dropped the subject's blood glucose down below one millimolar. That is universally fatal. If all of you were eating just a standard American diet and we injected that amount of insulin in your blood glucose, everybody here would die very quickly, right? So they must have been confident that they were not gonna hurt the subjects because the subjects were completely asymptomatic for hypoglycemia because their ketones were elevated. When I, when I read these, this work, if you go to an endocrinologist and you show them this, they would be like, this is impossible. Like, this, is, this could not happen. Because this literature was kind of buried in the archives. And it's, it's really fun to dig it up and to see kind of what happens, right? Because I teach medical students, you know, this scenario here. As your blood glucose drops down below three millimolar, you start to get central, you, your brain starts to dysfunction. And essentially you go into a coma and death when it goes below two millimolar. Well, they were at one millimolar here. So this was very inspiring to me because it gave me the idea that if we could put ketones into a supplement, then this could be an alternative fuel that the brain could use. So, and that could be achieved through a variety of different ways. So uh, my work, my initial work, was really focused on uh, mitigating oxygen toxicity seizures. And I was inspired by uh, Jim Abrams, the Hollywood producer of the Charlie Foundation. And I connected with him in 2012 prior to giving a TEDx talk uh, it, in Tampa. And uh, you know, he told me that you know, I could use some of the slides and put him in the story, which really inspired me. I grabbed this slide off the Johns Hopkins website, uh, and I mentioned Jim because in 1994, I was a nutrition student, and I saw Dateline NBC where he talked about this weird diet. And I kind of wrote it off because I, I thought ketogenic diets were like fad diets, and this was like a one-off, you know, some kind of rare scenario. But anyway, uh, his son Charlie tried multiple anti-epileptic drugs and failed, and when he was put on a ketogenic diet, it essentially cured his seizures. Not only did his seizures stop, he was able to get off of the diet, and his seizures never came back again after following the diet for several years. So 
uh, and a lot of people tell me, it's like, you know, I heard about this ketogenic diet thing and it must have been a fad because I don't hear about it anymore, but I'm here to tell you that the research on the ketogenic diet is exploding and there are many different applications emerging for therapeutic ketosis. So if we do an analysis of the literature, we could see in 2022, there was 604 peer-reviewed publications on ketogenic diet therapies. And in 2023, in January, I did an analysis of PubMed and there's 2000 and um, in 2023, 600, 726 peer-reviewed publications and 604 the year before. Another uh, movie that really inspired me was with Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep did a movie about the ketogenic diet and it was called First Do No Harm. And it was really a docudrama about Jim's story. And that was a movie that I watched uh, well over 1997, it was years later, but it inspired me to go down this path. And when I first started studying the ketogenic diet in uh, 2008 or 9, there were only about two or three applications. So uh, yes, or today, actually, I did a full analysis of clinicaltrials.gov, and I counted 498 registered clinical trials on the ketogenic diet. So, and you can look at the various applications, which of course, epilepsy, it's very well accepted that epilepsy is um, the standard of care for drug refractory epilepsy, but there's Alzheimer's disease, 14 clinical trials, Parkinson's disease, cancer, which is a big part of what our lab does. Uh, but, and these are more of the evidence-based applications here, but then you have some really interesting emerging applications. For example, uh, metabolic psychiatry is a field that's exploding now. And psychiatric disorders can include bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, uh, anxiety, uh, autism, also anorexia. Anorexia, come to find out, kills more people as a psychiatric disorder. More people die of anorexia than any other psychiatric disorder. So that was really interesting to me. Uh, so there's a number of, I've been in touch with the researchers that are doing a lot of this research and it's just really uh, inspiring that we are kind of going back to our roots and using ketogenic metabolic therapies. Um, and what's important about this research, I put in the key term ketogenic diet, but many of these studies here, I would say about 20 to 30% of them were also using a, various ketone supplements or medium chain triglyceride oil, also known as MCT oil, that you could get at CVS or even Walmart or Amazon. So, uh, so that leads us to some of the research being done on ketone supplementation. So our lab studies ketogenic diet and we also study various forms of ketone supplementation that could further augment the therapeutic efficacy of the ketogenic diet or in some cases people cannot are unwilling or they're unable to follow a ketogenic diet, and you could add ketone supplementation to a standard diet and get many of the benefits. The rat studies that we did, the anti-seizure effects, those rat studies were eating a high carbohydrate standard rat chow, and we gave them ketone supplementation 30 minutes prior to inducing a seizure, and it gave neuroprotective effects in 30 minutes, just eating a standard rodent chow. So I did a full analysis of the studies uh, this morning, and there were 147 registered clinical trials investigating as a form of therapy a ketone supplement. So when I was here nine years ago, this is very new technology, so th there, was, there was no studies. So for this level of research to be done for registered clinical trials, that's very inspiring. So there are different types of exogenous ketones, ketone esters, ketone salts, uh, the ketone salts taste much better, and I think that would be more of a, a commercially available salt that you could bet at any Walgreens or Walmart or Amazon. Uh, but also uh, MCT oil, which is derived from coconut oil. When we ingest medium chain triglyceride oil, and I know Dr. Mary Newport, uh, who's a dear friend of mine, gave lectures here, I think maybe one or two lectures. Also, Dr. Stephen Cunane from Canada, gave a lecture uh, and Pensacola in here too on the benefits of MCT oil for Alzheimer's disease. So there's 705 studies just on MCT oil. So this is cheap, it's readily available, and it's highly efficacious when, you know, what do we have for Alzheimer's drugs here? <laughs> the, I'm here to tell you that MCT oil probably works better 
than many of these Alzheimer's drugs that you hear a lot about in the news. So just keep that in mind. Of course, you can't make it a drug, but it's, it's readily available, and there's science to back it up in even human clinical trials. So these are a few clinical trials that I'm involved in, and, uh, and there's a number of emerging applications for ketone supplementation, um, including migraines, you know, cardiovascular function, type 2 diabetes. There's a lot of exercise studies. So there's many studies using exogenous ketones to further enhance uh, exercise performance and also exercise recovery. And we're doing some of that work too. So uh, I want to, I'm giving you kind of a lot of science and just sort of some context to understand uh, what I'll be talking about. But so I think it's important to acknowledge that we hear about the keto diet all the time. Uh, being, in a, being on the keto diet, ketogenic diet is very unique. It's unlike any other diet because it's defined by the elevation of an objective biomarker. When you go on a Mediterranean diet, when you go on a vegan diet, when you go on any kind of diet, um, there's really not science to basically sort of objectively demonstrate that you're on the diet. So the ketogenic diet is very scientific in that it's very calculated and there's an objective biomarker, which is breath ketones, urine ketones, or blood ketones, or interstitial ketones, which I'll talk about later. And there's different levels that actually predict and indicate that you're in a state of therapeutic ketosis. So that's important to recognize, that we have commercially available tools that can put us into a state of therapeutic ketosis, and we have commercially available monitoring technologies that we can get at any drugstore or Amazon that could give us feedback that we can titrate the level of ketones to achieve a therapeutic range for our particular disorder, if we're treating something or using it as a lifestyle approach. So there are many different types of ketogenic diets from the classical ketogenic diet, the modified Atkins diet, or the modified and the medium chain triglyceride diet, which is a low carb diet with added MCT oil, uh, as a type of fat. MCT oil has no flavor or no taste, so you can incorporate it into salad dressings. You can in use it uh, to cook with. You can add it to different dishes. Uh, you can even add it to oatmeal. I've you know, got several emails from, from people that, older people that added it to oatmeal and saw benefits in, in regards to cognition. So they're adding it to uh, a diet that's not ketogenic or low carb. So, and then you have uh, exogenous ketones that are being sold. One of the products I use is called Keto Start. Uh, it tastes good, it's electrolytes. So you have beta-hydroxybutyrate, which, which is a ketone, and it's bound to sodium, potassium, magne magnesium, or calcium. You ingest it, the ketones go and give your body energy, give your brain energy, and your body can also use the electrolytes, which tend to be depleted a little bit more if you're on a low-carb diet or ketogenic diet. Ketone esters, we do, we've published most of our research with ketone esters, although the salts are starting to achieve the same level of potency. Uh, and we're, we're putting, because ketone esters taste so bad, we've actually put them into pills and we're using it in that study at, at Duke University. So as of right now, I've just talked about ketones as a source of energy that we can monitor with commercially available technology, uh, a source of energy for the brain, for the heart um, and for our muscles. But a lot of the cutting edge research right now is focused on the signaling effects of ketones. So ketones are not only uh, a very favorable energy metabolite, uh, they can sort of generate more ATP per oxygen uh, than glucose. So early studies were done in the heart showing that there's enhanced energetic efficiency in the heart when it's metabolizing ketones for energy. So ketones are very good for the heart. Uh, your heart burns mostly fatty acids, and if you're on a ketogenic diet, ketones too. Uh, more, your heart burns more fat for fuel than it does for glucose, than glucose for fuel. But an important thing to also uh, understand, and this is really only the last five or 10 years, that ketones have very powerful signaling effects. When you're on a ketogenic diet, it changes your metabolic physiology, this changes your brain energy metabolism, and it also profoundly changes the neuropharmacology of your brain, meaning that the neurotransmitters that keep that elevate our mood, uh, neurotransmitters that are associated with anti, 
uh, epilepsy effects, neurotransmitters that can improve cognition and memory are significantly altered when you're in a state of ketosis. So a lot of the research now, especially in metabolic psychiatry, when it comes to bipolar disorder, when it comes to schizophrenia, when it comes to depression, a lot of large-scale clinical trials are really focusing on how our brain is changing, not only energetically, but also the neurotransmitters. And many, many of these neurotransmitters are amenable to pharmacological manipulation, like SSRIs, and you've heard of many antipsychotic drugs. So what the ketogenic diet does is bring many of these neurotransmitters back into balance, uh, which can be achieved potentially without drug therapy. So there are potential side effects of a clinical ketogenic diet. So a clinical ketogenic diet is like a prescription strength ketogenic diet. There's like the internet keto, where you're just like, do under 50 grams of carbohydrates a day. And then there's a clinical ketogenic diet where the macronutrients and the ratios are very carefully calculated. Uh, for example, in pediatric epilepsy or even adult epilepsy. So from the world of, so it's been, the ketogenic diet has been used in epilepsy for over 100 years. In 1920 and 1921, it started to be used. Uh, some contraindications are pancreatitis, liver disease, and fatty acid oxidation disorders. Our liver is the site of ketone production, so if our liver is not healthy, we cannot achieve and sustain uh, ketosis. Carnitine deficiency. Carnitine is a supplement that you can take. There's primary carnitine deficiency and secondary. So I'm not going to go into it, but, uh, but I'll say that when you go on a ketogenic diet, carnitine is a molecule that helps you transport the fat into the tissues. Because we're burning so much fat on a ketogenic diet, we could de potentially deplete our bodies of carnitine if we're not eating enough meat. Uh, so in the early studies, we're just mostly dairy-based and in kids, they saw carnitine deficiency uh, quite often. Electrolyte deficiencies, this could be overcome by taking an electrolyte supplement, a ketone electrolyte supplement, like a ketone salt that could be used. Lipid abnormalities, in some kids, triglycerides, LDL cholesterol, but ApoB is a better measure of that. That can be problematic in some people. Uh, some people may naturally see an elevation of the LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, but uh, many other biomarkers improve in a more favorable direction. So you have to look at all the other biomarkers um, sort of together, and that's what I'm gonna talk about sort of other biomarkers that are associated with cardiometabolic risk. A lot of people ask, can I follow a ketogenic diet if I have kidney stones? There is a higher prevalence of kidney stones in kids that follow a ketogenic diet. So this is something that you wanna monitor closely if you go on a low carb diet or ketogenic diet for kidney stones. You could overcome the risk of that by increasing your water intake and also taking an electrolyte supplement. So electrolytes alkalinize the blood and uh, in a way that decreases the potential for kidney stones. Also, your gallbladder is involved uh, in fatty acid fat metabolism and some people have their gallbladder removed. So uh, a lot of questions uh, often get asked, can someone follow a ketogenic diet if they had their gallbladder removed? So you can, as long as you start a low carb diet that's moderate in fat and gradually add fat later, you can uh, adapt to uh, a ketogenic diet. So I've communicated with many patients, for example, that did not have a gallbladder, that did quite well because you're your pancreas can, can, over, can compensate and, and produce the enzymes needed. A lot of questions I get about females in ketogenic diets. So there is literature in the epilepsy literature that uh, there's a higher potential for amenorrhea, which is a woman losing her period. So that's associated, uh, quite often associated with going on a ketogenic diet and it's calorie restricted and plus you have the females exercising or over-exercising. This produces an energy deficit, and this has a counter-regulatory hormonal response. So a lot of females, younger females that are into running, long-distance running especially, uh, or on restrictive diets can lose their period. And uh, I, think, I think that explains that. Uh, that's some aspects of that. Also, there has been reports of lower thyroid on a ketogenic diet, especially in women. But a report that recently came out, and the 
the, uh, the PM ID, uh, if you can see this number here, if you just Google that number, it'll bring you up to the actual publication. It's the PubMed ID number. Uh, a recent report came out uh, showing that women have lower thyroid, but these women were exceptionally lean and they are exceptionally athletic. So the low thyroid was definitely not impacting their body composition because they had already they were already so lean on a ketogenic diet. So I think it's, uh, that's still being unpacked and there's research being done on that right now, investigators working on that. So I get this question a lot, so I think, you know, it's, it's, I'll say the research is still in progress to elucidate why that's happening. So I think it's really important for people to do self-monitoring of biomarkers. And in regards to ketones, um, you know, if you can't, these are two quotes that you might, have heard if you can't, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it, right? If you don't know where you're at. So it's really important to know where your baseline's at and then measure it so we can improve upon that, especially in the trajectory of enhancing your metabolic health and your health span and longevity, right? So another quote that gets thrown around is what gets measured uh, gets managed, right? By Peter Drucker. So there are a variety of ketogenic monitoring tools, and some of them are cheaper and some of them are more expensive. The urine ketone strips are still used by many pediatric and uh, epilepsy clinics, and they are relatively, you know, okay. A lot of biohackers kind of poo-poo them, but I still think they are good tools to show you if you're in a relative state of ketosis. So I think the, the barrier of entry could be to use these urine ketone strips. They're maybe 25 cents per strip. And then many of them, too, have a number of other, um, a number of other, let me see if I get the pointer here. They measure up to 10 different things, like they look to see if your, your protein levels, your pH levels, if you have an infection. Uh, so they're, especially the Siemens multi-sticks, they're, really, uh, they're really great tools and they're super cheap. So it's a good way to get started. They measure urine acetoacetate and then there's another, a breath meter on the market, uh, a device that you can blow into and it'll give you your relative calculation of ketones in the breath. When you go on a ketogenic diet, your body produces three ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. So the acetoacetate's measured in the urine, acetone is measured in the breath, it gives your breath kind of like a fruity smell, uh, especially when you first start, and then that kind of go, goes away. And then the blood ketone meters is what we mostly use for research, and uh, these are, there's two different devices. There's Abbott makes the precision extra device and I have pictures of the devices here. And then most people nowadays are actually using the Keto Mojo device because the strips are about half the amount of money and also it's a bit more accurate. So that's the Keto Mojo device uh, right here on the right. So the future direction, and I know Dr. Morley Stone talked about continuous glucose monitors, and he touched upon, I believe, continuous ketone monitors and continuous lactate monitors. I'm just completing the paperwork to actually get uh, a ketone glucose, a ketone glucose and lactate continuous monitor. So almost like you, have, you could have your phone and have a real-time snapshot of your metabolic physiology. Obviously, this can be very, very important for the warfighter, for the Navy SEAL, for the astronaut, which is kind of like the realm that I work in, but I'm probably more excited about the clinical applications of this technology for managing everything from epilepsy to cancer to rare diseases. We study inborn errors of metabolism, and I talk to these families, and it's just, it's even a simple continuous ketone monitor, which I wear, can help families tremendously by, you could just see compliance to the diet, you know, and I think there's just so much use to this technology. Um, for example here, this is a type, oops, a type one diabetic, if you look here, on a standard, you know, American Diabetes Association high carb diet right here, and this is after uh, like two weeks of being on a low carb diet. So these, these postprandial glucose spikes, the more spikes you have, that's actually taking years off of your life. Those spikes are causing glycation, they're causing inflammation, they're impacting your brain function. So if you can achieve a, a low and steady glucose, that is going to have profound effects on your metabolic health and your lifespan. 
So this technology is emerging now where we can put something the size of a nickel on our arm and it measures what's called interstitial glucose, ketones, or lactate. And the, the first publication came out on this in 2020 or 2021, and this is the PubMed number if you want to Google it, and this is just shows various sensors that were being developed, but now Abbott has the Abbott Lingo device. It's in the UK. It should be coming over soon. I'll be testing it. I'm excited. Uh, I was hoping to get some data to show you here, but uh, it didn't happen because there's a lot of paperwork to using these devices. But so that's, that's, in, that's the biomarker ketone. So as mentioned, the ketogenic diet is defined objectively by the elevation and sustainment of ketones. And um, I think, and here are the levels too. So I just want to mention, uh, just for reference, uh, you know, the, the urine ketone strips have like a little color indicator, and then the breath ketone has the different levels that you can achieve. So that's low ketones to high ketones. And then in, in regards to blood level of ketosis, if you're above 0.5, that's the threshold for ketosis, right? So... Now there are other super important biomarkers that are, uh, that are really important in regards to when you're on a ketogenic diet. And blood pressure is, is one of them. You've all heard of blood pressure, so it's not, not, nothing innovative. But when we go to the doctor, we typically get our blood pressure measured once. And I don't know about you, but I have white coat syndrome. When I go there and I measure my blood pressure, the last time it was 135 over like 86 or something like that. So, uh, so when I measure my blood pressure at home, I measure it, and this is what you have to do. So I've talked to many, I've talked to the best practitioners in the world, the smartest scientists and the clinicians. You take three readings three times a day and do that, you know, once every couple weeks. So the first reading for me, I was going to take a picture of it, but it's the exact same reading I found on the Amazon uh, picture of this device. So, so I took that picture out, and it was literally the exact same reading. And this is also the device I use, the Omron. I think it's like 50 bucks, 60 bucks on Amazon. Uh, but blood pressure is incredibly important, and I think it can be a silent killer. So know your blood pressure and measure it correctly. So you want to sit down, rested, get your arm in the proper position, and then measure uh, once, rest and relax two or three minutes, measure again, rest and relax two or three minutes and measure again. On the third measurement, for me, just the other day, I was 99 over 58, which is kind of low, but I feel like I can also you know, lower my blood pressure. When I'm hyped up and at work, maybe lecturing and things like that, it could be elevated and kind of high. So uh, people are working on continuous blood pressure measurements. So you could have, a, so you could have that, like a continuous glucose measurement. So optimal level uh, is you know, under 120, uh, systolic over diastolic. So know this number and know how to measure it, right? And if it's high at the doctors, uh, get a device and measure it at home. So that's like the simple, that's one that you're all kind of familiar with. And then we all have access to these continuous glucose monitors. Your fasting blood glucose is probably one of the best indicators of your metabolic health than any other you know, uh, metabolite, right? So we have access to this technology. So not just your fasting blood glucose is one number, but what's probably more important is what happens when you eat a meal. If your glucose is 85 but spikes up to 300 after you eat a meal, those spikes can accumulate over time and they're doing damage to your body. So, uh, so you want you know, an optimal level to be under 120 in regards to uh, you know, a, a continuous glucose monitor. So, so your fasting glucose, you want it under 100 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, but then there's technologies that I was talking about, uh, CGM devices, a continuous glucose monitor. These are sold by Abbott and also sold by Dexcom. And you do need a prescription, but I'm not gonna tell you the websites, but if you Google like, you know, CGMs, you can find them online and then pick them up at Costco, pretty cheap. So my medical students figured it out. They're like, Dr. D'Agostino, I don't need a prescription. I could do this. So they're all wearing their CGMs now. So, uh, so you don't need a prescription, but you know, I'm not going to give you the website name, but you can Google it and find it. Uh, and then there's companies that I consult for, for example, like Levels Health. So they create an app that integrates like your Fitbit, it integrates your Apple Watch, it integrates your blood work all into one app, and then you have your whole health dashboard like on your app. So this technology is very useful because 
I went to Sam's Club and I bought a keto cereal that I see everywhere, it's very popular, I'm not gonna name the brand name, but when I ate it, uh, my glucose spiked from 82 to about 135. So if this cereal was truly low carb and keto, uh, it would have not elevated my blood glucose to that. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of products or a lot of food products being marketed, snap products that are keto and low carb, but some of these things spike me up higher than a Snickers bar. So they're being so, so keep that in mind. I would not know this unless I wore a continuous glucose monitor. So uh, by wearing this technology, it allows me to be, uh, to investigate <laughs> all these keto foods emerging on the market. Uh, so it's been kind of eye-opening to see that. So, uh, so a continuous glucose monitor is not something your doctor is gonna tell you to use unless you have type one diabetes or more recently type two diabetes. But I think that wearing a continuous glucose monitor for even two weeks will give you tremendous insight into your metabolism. Insulin is the most important metabolic hormone hands down that we could measure. And curiously, it's not part of a comprehensive metabolic panel. So everybody who has health insurance typically gets, you know, uh, your insurance covers your blood work once or twice a year. So you get a comprehensive metabolic panel, but insulin is not on it, but it is by far the most important metabolic hormone. So ask your doctor to add insulin uh, and you can convince them maybe, you know, so you say you have diabetes in the family or something like that, and they could probably add it on. But metabolic syndrome results from what's called insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia. High insulin fuels heart disease risk and cardiovascular disease risk, so keep that in mind. And insulin, high levels of insulin, are a very potent stimulus for many different types of cancers. So your blood level of insulin can highly predict uh, getting cancer, your level of inflammation. Also, if you have cancer, uh, the outcomes will be very, high, very bad if your, blood if your blood insulin and glucose are high. So, and they don't always correlate. Sometimes people can have relatively low glucose and high insulin, and if you have high, glu high uh, glucose levels, your insulin is probably also high too. Uh, so the optimal levels uh, are, and I use, uh, I talk about self-monitoring because there are kits that are available. ZRT Labs is one of the kits that we use. We use it in our NASA project. And they're blood spot cards, uh, cards that you can put blood on these cards and actually it goes to a lab and gets analyzed. So these are the optimal levels of insulin uh, based upon uh, you know, a number of different healthcare, the leading experts in the world. Uh, and we did a clinical trial and for the general population, we're finding insulin somewhere between like five to eight to 10 for people that are relatively healthy. So that is definitely not as far from optimal. So the, the fastest way to bring your glucose down is to take out processed foods and to remove sugar and to decrease your overall carbohydrate consumption. Hemoglobin A1C, so this may be something that you included in blood work. If not, you should, uh, especially as we get older, our blood glucose creeps up and hemoglobin A1C is an aggregate for uh, glucose levels over three months. And high hemoglobin A1C is associated with cardiovascular risk, uh, neuropathy, uh, nephropathy, inflammation in the kidneys, and also retinopathy. Your eye is probably the most metabolically demanding organ, so that's why when your blood glucose level gets high, for example, in like type one diabetes, you could go blind. So keeping your blood glucose levels low and steady is the most important thing that we could do for our eye health, especially I am genetically predisposed to macular degeneration. So I am kind of zeroed in. That actually motivated me to get my glucose optimal and under control. And, uh, and hemoglobin A1C, if you want the optimal levels, you want to get 5.2% or lower. Generally speaking, lower is better. If you're 4.2, that's really low, but that's great. You know, so uh, at one point, I was very restrictive ketogenic diet. I went down to 3.9 or 3.5, and that's really low. But now I'm typically about 4.2. So, uh, so these levels are, again, these levels, optimal, normal, prediabetes. Some of these are taken from the medical textbooks, but it's vetted out through a group of practitioners that I know that kind of... Uh, are involved in longevity and health optimization. 
Uric acid is something that you probably have not heard of, but you can add it to your comprehensive uh, metabolic panel. And uric acid or hyperuricemia is implicated in the etiology of gout. Uh, I've heard about gout eating uh, lots of meat and organ meats and also high levels of fructose and sugar and alcohol are really uh, linked to, uh, to gout. So high uric acid is a contributing factor to hypertension, metabolic disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Again, so foods that are really high in purines include like liver, kidney, heart. I eat a lot of those foods, but my uric acid is low because it's, it's low. I eat, drink very little alcohol, maybe one, one glass of wine two or three times a week. Uh, but if you have four to six glasses of wine or alcohol per day, your uric acid is probably high. And that's probably one of the most uh, important pathological consequences of alcohol consumption is high uric acid. And um, uric acid can transiently go up when you start a ketogenic diet because it competes for the ketone transporter for elimination. But once you start a ketogenic diet and your body upregulates the transporter over time and your body balances out, it takes about uh, a few weeks and, and, a couple, and some people a few months for uric acid to come back down. So if you are monitoring that, keep that in mind that when you start a ketogenic diet, it could transiently increase, but that's not pathological. Generally speaking, the field does not feel that that's pathological. And here are the optimal, normal, and high levels. High-sensitivity C-reactive protein is probably one of the most important biomarkers that has, was put on my radar about 10 years ago, and a lot of the emerging research is clearly showing that high-sensitivity C-reactive protein, when it's elevated, that's associated with depression. When it's elevated, it triggers you know, mania in bipolar. It can trigger a seizure. Uh, if you have an autoimmune disease, that is tightly coupled to high-sensitivity C-reactive protein. If you have gut issues, so that could be ulcerative colitis, IBF, uh, Crohn's disease, things like that, that is uh, managing that disease is tightly coupled to your high-sensitivity C-reactive protein, which uh, when it's high, your immune system is triggered and your immune system is essentially attacking your body and creating inflammation. So uh, high-sensitivity C-reactive protein is, it's high-sensitivity, so it can detect levels in the lower range, which can be really helpful when you're adjusting your diet and optimizing your diet. Uh, C-reactive protein by itself has been associated with obesity, heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease. If we have, if we get COVID, if we have a bacterial infection, if we have cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, herpes simplex virus, if we get shingles, our inflammation goes up, we'll see our C-reactive protein go up, and most likely we'll start feeling headaches, we'll get brain fog, so that systemic inflammation will trigger neuroinflammation, and that can have really profound effects on cognitive function and brain health. So HSCRP is a very sensitive indicator of that, and these are the optimal levels, and uh, yeah, I did like a little experiment on myself where, um, so I did a 14, I mostly eat a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, and I did 14 days of a healthy, like healthy whole grains, healthy, uh, higher carbohydrate diet, which was just 200 to 300 grams a day, which is probably a little bit under the standard recommended amount. Uh, I kept my calories matched to what I was eating with, so my body weight did not go up or down, but my, H, my HSCRP went from non-detectable to 0.1 to 1.1. That's still pretty low, and that's like you know, a healthy range, but it showed that when I added carbohydrates back into my diet, something was happening, maybe gut permeability, maybe there's some factor in there that was, you know, I was trending to have more inflammation. Uh, and my hemoglobin A1C started trending up too. So, oops, sorry about that. Uh, so you could see on... This side, this was my baseline ketogenic diet here. My insulin was 3.2, HSCRP was 0 0.1, and my uh, hemoglobin A1C was 4.7, like all. So it's, so if I, I just did it for 14 days, but if I did that for three months, you know, I think those levels were trending uh, in the opposite direction I want them to go into. 
So another thing I added at the last minute is vitamin B12 because uh, even when I was in grad school, I was, you know, I had friends and I knew nurses that would go into nursing homes and they would do blood work on many of the, many of the, the people that lived there and see low B12 was like ubiquitous. And they, they would give B12 shots and within the course of a day, people would wake up and have more energy like you gave them a big cup of coffee, right? So, uh, and vitamin B12 is involved in hundreds if not thousands of enzymatic reaction and is tightly coupled to our metabolism of fatty acids and also carbohydrates and also protein. So vitamin B12 goes by the name cobalamin and then there's cyanocobalamin, which is the synthetic form that we get uh, as a supplement and methylcobalamin is more of a natural form and uh, probably a better form if you're gonna supplement with methylcobalamin. So low B12 can result in symptoms of Alzheimer's disease so if you go to get worked up and you have symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, one of the things that they test for is vitamin B12 deficiency because it will mimic Alzheimer's disease. So it's so important for brain health that if our levels are low, it can trigger Alzheimer's disease-like symptoms. It also, uh, low levels of vitamin B12, if that's sustained, causes cortical and hippocampal atrophy. That means our brains literally shrink if we do not have enough B12. So this can be reversed if it's caught early enough with B12. So you wanna get your B12 levels measured and you wanna use a, a very bioavailable supplement, ideally in the form of methyl cobalamin. Uh, it supports red blood cells. There's a condition called pernicious anemia. And if you are low, really low in uh, vitamin B12, it, your uh, red blood cells drop and you have anemia. And it's also important for homocysteine, which is cardiovascular health. So these are uh, levels that I think are important. And after the age of 50, we produce less uh, of a protein, uh, something called intrinsic factor. So our lower GI system can actually synthesize uh, vitamin B12, but we tend to absorb it in the upper to mid. So your body can make it, but it's not gonna be kind of absorbed. And as we age, we make less of this intrinsic factor that allows us to absorb the B12. So I think after the age of 50, you really wanna, you don't wanna go below 600 uh, is a good rule of thumb. So again, oh, I just wanna also mention that B12 is really high in ketogenic diet foods, especially mussels, uh, shellfish, uh, fish is really high, eggs, liver, uh, beef, um, you know, sardines, so all the stuff that I like to eat. So this, these are super high B12 foods. So, but even if you're older and you're eating a lot of these foods, like I said, you may not have um, the, the enzymatic metabolic machinery to absorb and assimilate that. So that's why you wanna get it checked, your B12 checked. So the last, we're coming to like the last biomarkers here, triglycerides, HDL, and ApoB, the lipids, right? So this is probably, I get more questions about this than any other thing. So high triglycerides are the most important lipid biomarker to measure, tightly coupled with metabolic syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and acute pancreatitis. Elevated triglycerides indicate that there's a calorie surplus. People that go from a high carbohydrate diet to a high fat diet paradoxically lower their triglycerides because you're coaxing your body to oxidize fat for fuel. So we start clearing fat from the bloodstream. So higher LDL or HDL is associated with reduced cardiovascular risk, HDL being your good cholesterol. And then there was a UK study of around 400,000 participants uh, or people that found that higher levels of ApoB, ApoB correlates very highly with LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, but ApoB is a much better biomarker uh, than LDL. So uh, higher levels of ApoB were associated with lower lifespan, heart disease, and stroke. So not all doctors are familiar with ApoB. So when you get your blood work, request ApoB, uh, tell them that you saw a lecture, that the literature shows that it's a better bar biomarker than LDL, and they can't argue with that. So they could typically add it to, and then your insurance will cover it. Uh, even if they don't, I think it's about $40. So uh, I have the optimal levels of triglyceride here. I'm not gonna go through it, but optimal levels of HDL, generally higher is better, up to a certain point, um, and, uh, and ApoB levels. 
So I want to I want to mention that when you go on a ketogenic diet, many people will see an elevation of ApoB and LDL. So this is being studied and is actually uh, the basis of of a conference that I'm attending next month. Actually, people that have very low triglycerides and high HDL and then very high LDL, they f and that they're athletic and they're lean and they're overall healthy. This is a particular, what we call phenotype, which is lean mass hyperresponder. I'm not gonna go into it too much because it can get technical, but it's a very, it's one of the most intense areas of investigation right now that's being studied. So we don't, at this point in time, sufficiently understand if your LDL creeps up to very high levels when other biomarkers go in the right direction, if this is going to be atherogenic. Uh, we don't, uh, the data indicates that ApoB is correlated with poor outcomes, so I think it would be prudent to, uh, to even pharmacolo pharmacologically or even through manipulating your diet, the types of fats that you eat. Uh, and that's still debated if, you know, high saturated fat is the leading driver for elevated LDL or ApoB. I'll say it's an area of controversy, and I'm just, at this point in time, I'm kind of silent on it, but if you are at normal risk, uh, you want to keep it under 110 milligrams per deciliter, and uh, the optimal uh, ApoB is under 90 uh, if you are at high risk. So a lot of people have cardiovascular disease in their family because it's like the biggest killer, but if you are at low risk and you have really good, uh, and your other biomarkers are good, so your hemoglobin A1C, your blood pressure, your HDL, your triglycerides, and your ApoB is above 130, which means your LDL cholesterol would be about like 190 or something like that, and so many people email me that are in this situation, um, I would say you're not at, the hazard ratio is relatively low <laughs> if your other biomarkers are good. There's a lot of wind and a lot of uh, debate about this, but I am less concerned with the elevated LDL if you are metabolically healthy, I guess stated in that way. So, but the research is ongoing on that. So if you are trying to figure out like uh, if you have you know, a medical condition or you're just, your energy levels are low and you're trying to figure out, uh, you're trying to optimize your metabolism. There are different types of advanced testing that I use that you know we use in our studies and things like that. Genova Diagnostics is a great uh, company. They have a, a whole suite of different things, and I get things done at Quest Labs and um, ZRT Labs. Sell a lot of the home kits. But when you go on a ketogenic diet, here are my results. Here you might see some changes that uh, that are flagged as being uh, abnormal. So one would be, like in this case here, uh, my ketone levels are in the red. So red is bad, right? <laughs> red is beta OH butyric acid. That's beta hydroxybutyrate. That's a ketone. So this particular advanced test was telling me, like, you know, I have diabetes or something. So, uh, so it's really important that diet preference and other factors need to be considered when interpreting your results. So you need to have the person who's reading your results and telling you it needs to have some background on what you're doing. Uh, my omega-3 fatty acids were super, right, because I eat a lot of fish, and then I took another test called the omega quant test. Uh, my friend, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, who actually spoke here, told me about the omega quant test, so I took that, and I supplemented with like Nordic Naturals, another uh, omega-3 supplementation, and my omega-3 levels were like, they said the highest they've seen in almost anybody, right? So, which is really good. You want your omega-3 levels to be high and you want your omega-6 levels to be relatively low because they have the more potential to oxidize and trigger inflammation and autoimmune reactions. So uh, the advanced testing can also measure toxic elements. And I eat, I eat a ton of fish, but mostly small fish like uh, sardines and uh, mackerel and I was really happy to see, and I did multiple tests for heavy metals, the hair test, the blood test, and different things, that my lead and mercury were very low, but on this particular test, my bismuth, I didn't even know what that was, was totally, it was like off the charts. So we had been traveling to Dominican Republic where I was eating tons of fish and all you can eat, like these buffet things, and, um, and I, I, I had a tummy ache, so I took Pepto-Bismol, so Pepto-Bismol, <laughs> has bismuth in it, 
So uh, I got my results back. I was eager to take my test because I was eating so much fish. And I was like, if I have heavy metal poisoning, it's going to show up because I was eating like two or three pounds of fish a day. But uh, I did take one dose of Pepto-Bismol because I think I ate too much. And the test is so sensitive that it just it picked it up and it pinned it like it, it was like some abnormality. So I had to really do some digging to figure out why that abnormality showed up. Uh, so that's you know the 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 general the biomarkers that a panel of experts that I consult with really feel that these are absolutely essential, and your doctor is really not going to tell you about it. And even the blood pressure thing, like they're not going to measure unless you have clinically high blood pressure. They may measure blood pressure a couple times, but it's really important for you to have like a home blood pressure monitoring. Uh, so some takeaways are that you probably saw the science and the application of what I like to call ketone metabolic therapy. So a lot of people do intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding, and they do low-carb or they do, do ketone supplements. These things are not mutually exclusive. You could potentially do intermittent fasting, and when you're eating window, you could eat a low-carb diet or ketogenic diet, and then you could supplement on top of that. So there's many different, you know, ways that you could achieve and sustain therapeutic ketosis. I hopefully that was clear. I didn't talk too much about uh, fasting, but uh, I would direct you to the work of Dr. Walter Longo. He does the fasting mimicking diet and uh, Sachin Panda. I've interviewed both of them for the podcast, so uh, we have some interesting talks there. So therapeutic ketosis generally favorably shifts brain energy, neurotransmitter systems, and really important cardiometabolic biomarkers in the right direction. Uh, monitoring, I didn't get to talk about it. In another version of this talk that I had two hours, I talked about vitamin D, uh, measuring body composition, measuring strength as a biomarker. It's a physical biomarker. Measuring your activity levels, uh, stress and sleep. I mean, that's the big kind of elephant in the room, right? Because I found in myself is that emotional or psychological stress could shoot my HSCRP through the roof and actually trigger like... Uh, you know, metabolic, I could see it on my continuous glucose monitor. It can elevate my glucose. So these are important things to consider. Uh, you can measure your HRV. So I just added, you know, I get, I prefer to get body composition testing with a DEXA. So that's a DEXA scan of me. You could also, and now, like years ago, they were like two, three hundred dollars. And now I got this for 75 bucks and I just do it once a year. And it does my bone mineral density. So a lot of People, practitioners may be concerned about your bone mineral density on a low carb diet or ketogenic diet because of the mild acidosis. But my bone mineral density, I don't know if you could see, it's like my, it's, uh, it's right here. It's almost off the charts. So uh, I've been following ketogenic diet for like 15 years. So uh, I don't think that's impacting bone mineral density. There's something that you could do to test your hand grip strength. So your grip strength, interestingly, correlates to your whole body strength. So one of the best, you know, biomarkers that we can measure is grip strength. It's like a couple times a year, and that's a really good overall measure uh, of, your, of your general strength in general. So, and then there's a lot of wearable technologies, like, you know, I use the Fitbit, there's the Aura Ring, there's the Whoop Strap. These things, uh, if you wear them, they could give you great insight on to your sleep and actually improve your, what we call sleep hygiene. So for me, I realized that I can't have two or three glasses of wine at nighttime at nine o'clock because it's going to completely zap my deep sleep and I'm gonna feel just not right the next day, but if I wasn't monitoring this, so this was literally my, uh, my sleep last night, right? So you wanna get that deep sleep and then kick on the REM. I wake up and pee about three o'clock, then I go back to sleep and then I go <laughs> right back into like REM sleep where I'm like dreaming and everything. So this is like the normal profile uh, that you wanna see. But if I had, uh, a couple of nights ago I had alcohol and it was like no deep sleep and then like sketchy REM sleep. And then I was like not happy the next day, I was irritable. So, uh, but I wouldn't know that if I wasn't wearing these technologies. So these things, you don't have to wear them all the time, but it just gives you insights to improve. So here's, Current projects, I'm not gonna go on into it. I kind of hit on a lot of the stuff. We do a lot of animal research. I mentor a lot of PhD medical students, undergrads that do research on cancer and seizures and different uh, inborn errors of metabolism. Uh, they, these are rare diseases, but ketogenic therapies really offer hope to a lot of these families that have kids that have these diseases. And we're doing, 
we've moved the, the, the rat science into human clinical trials, and Dr. Bruce Derrick is doing an amazing job uh, conducting these trials. They're not easy to do at Duke University. Uh, I also, I teach medical students, and I have them working on uh, projects where we're looking at continuous glucose monitors as behavioral tools in non-diabetics to improve uh, our food selection and really in optimizing metabolic health in people that are non-diabetic. So using these as tools to prevent diabetes from happening in the first place. So I think it could potentially encourage healthcare companies and insurance companies to pay a little bit now instead of a lot later. For example, if a family, if everybody over 50 has type 2 diabetes and people in this family in their 40s get these continuous glucose monitors for like 40 bucks a month or whatever, and then they can nail down and prevent diabetes from happening in the first place, right? So, and we're doing uh, a number, I have, uh, I'm very interested in this, this molecule called D-allulose, which is an epimer of fructose, and it's in a product called RX Sugar. And I have to admit, I am a science advisor for them. They help fund research in the lab on this, and it's called, you can buy it at Walmart, uh, these chocolate bars, they're called RX Sugar. And uh, D-allulose is very interesting because it, it uses the same transporter as fructose, uh, like high fructose corn syrup, but it promotes a lowering of blood glucose, and uh, it also increases something called GLP-1. So you've heard of Ozempic, right? <laughs> so these drugs that people are injecting to lose weight, so D-allulose, which is found in these chocolate bars, RX sugar, can elevate GLP-1 and actually uh, uh, reduce our appetite. So there's some really interesting effects of these molecules. So with that, I probably talked over, I want to thank you for your attention. Be glad to entertain any questions you have. I have to give thanks to my beautiful wife who couldn't be here today because she's nursing a sheep that got injured today on the farm. <laughs> But you could see her, she's on the bottom with our cows, and we didn't get our sheep yet at that point in time. But, uh, but yeah, I'd also like to plug uh, just everybody in my lab because they're just such an amazing crew. And uh, Keto Nutrition is my website. It's an informational website. Don't really sell much, but just information on there. And then the Metabolic uh, Health Summit and also the Metabolic Link Podcast be sure to tune in. And I, I want to mention that I'm really inspired by the education outreach that IHMC does with these lectures and also with STEM Talk podcasts. So be sure to listen to all your episodes of STEM Talk podcasts because uh, Ken has some incredible uh, guests on there. So thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Dom, so much. So we're going to be able to take just a few minutes of questions. So I see two hands. Okay, okay, whoa. Okay, wait a minute. I've got to remember this. I'm going to throw this at you, okay? Okay. Okay, I had my first epileptic seizure on November 1st of this past year at the age of 72. Did you email me? I did. Oh, yes, I meant yes. to. Okay, yeah, great. Yes, Thanks. and um, I had another one um, in January, and it was actually when I was doing Dr. Boz's sardine challenge. <laughs> do you know Dr. Boz? Yes, I do. Annette, yeah. yes, yes. I was uh -huh. doing her three days. I was yep. ha a little over halfway through a three days um, mm -hmm. sardine challenge, and I had my third, my first ever. Um, when I was awake, all the others were while I was sleeping. So I don't know what that means because I wasn't eating sugar at all. Yeah. Um, so my question though is, how do you match me up with someone that's doing research? I'm willing well, to try the ketogenic diet. Yeah. Well, in that particular episode, like people, a lot of people, an abnormal stress can trigger a seizure. Right? So we had a patient that we flew in one time for Metabolic Health Summit, and the stress of the flight triggered a seizure in my car when I was picking him up from the airport. And, and that was, you know, and it's really traumatizing to see that. So uh, sleep is absolutely essential, like, you know, sleep hygiene. And sleep. But any, uh, I'll say this, when you go on a ketogenic diet, it's a stress to the body and alters stress hormones. So if you're doing, I'm not as familiar with the sardine challenge or whatever, but it's, if it's calorie restricted, that could elevate, for example, cortisol, 
or activate your sympathetic nervous system in a way that could be a perceived threat and could change the brain in a way that could trigger a seizure. But the etiology of epilepsy is like largely unknown. And I'll, you know, I'll say that. And there's, but what's very interesting about a, a ketogenic diet when you're truly in therapeutic ketosis is that uh, when you have achieved therapeutic ketosis, it's therapeutic for a wide range of seizure disorders, including temporal lobe epilepsy, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, Dravet syndrome, you know, oxygen toxicity seizures, uh, and many different other types of seizure disorders, independent of the etiology. Therapeutic ketosis, if the diet is calculated and precise and ketone levels are maintained, that correlates with seizure control. So I would maybe advocate for getting some of the technologies mentioned here, like a ketone monitor is maybe like 40, 50 bucks, and then just you know getting your ketone levels, uh, achieving that, and then sustaining that. And then working with a practitioner too, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's not always easy, I don't yeah. Yeah, we need more of them. Education is like really, really important. Yep, to train these practitioners. Yeah, it's great to hear that uh, the ketogenic diet can help with a lot of metabolic diseases. Uh, a lot of us, uh, however, do suffer from autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. We don't normally think of those as metabolic diseases, but you've presented some evidence here that yep. perhaps that can be used to treat systemic inflammation. Are there good clinical studies to show that the ketogenic diet can reduce systemic inflammation and be helpful in treating autoimmune diseases. Yeah, that's another area. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov, uh, maybe two or three, just two or three. It wasn't really kind of on that list there, but um, but for autoimmune diseases, uh, the triggers are can be multifactorial, but typically in the diet. So what the ketogenic diet is, is it's an elimination diet, and it's it typically eliminating a, an antigen, an immune you know, stimulator, if you will. Uh, I'll say this, I get a lot of questions about the carnivore diet. So a carnivore diet, especially if it's a fatty cuts of meat, is a type of a ketogenic diet. And uh, the Dr. Brent, Dr. Uh, Brenda Lennertz at Harvard Medical School is doing, I would say, uh, you know, has group of people on a carnivore diet. It's not a, a super control trial, but if people who have been using the carnivore diet, and many of them are using it for autoimmune disorders and looking at kind of cardiometabolic risk factors. And over the course of months now, it's an ongoing clinical trial, but she recently presented uh, uh, at the conference, and it looked like a carnivore diet was could be a health, healthy diet, and people could achieve and sustain sort of mild ketosis with that. And that diet seems to be remarkably well, work remarkably well for autoimmune disorders, probably because all you eat is meat and water, right? So, it's a, so the question is, can you sustain it? There are people who are sustaining just eating meat only and doing quite well on it. Uh, it sounds kind of odd, but... Um, and I was skeptical in the beginning, but science is emerging, even at Harvard Medical School, where there's going to be publications on this, particularly on the autoimmune front. So um, I, meat, I guess, is a, your main source for your diet. It makes sense as hunter-gatherers, but we were mm -hmm. eating, like, healthy, wild meat. Yeah. Like, so now with factory farming and corn-fed beef and antibiotics, a lot of us have been moving away from more meat. Like, okay, well, let's go with fish. And then you hear that wild fish is full of, yeah, heavy metals yeah. and plastic. Yeah. And fish farming is full of polluted water. And so what is your advice for finding healthy mm. meats? Uh, get local meat, especially here in Florida, we have there's a huge amount of cows just driving up here on 75. It's like cows and cows. There. I didn't realize that until I moved to Florida. I was, I was driving down, moving from Ohio, and I was like, I've never saw so many cows in my life. So uh, we have cows, but our cows are rescued cows. They were on their way to the slaughter, so my, my wife, you know, the cows warm their hearts, so now we're not, we're never going to eat our cows. But, uh, 
But yeah, by you have many options here in Florida for local grass-fed uh, meat. You know, so visit your local butcher. Most be, instead of you know, sometimes Publix gets. Uh, a, Interestingly, two of our cows are from <laughs> the Odor Republic. Uh, they were going to the, the slaughterhouse. But, uh, but yeah, go to your local butcher and, or also find out where your meat's coming from. And usually, I mean, you can't, you get some remarkably good meat here in Florida. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, so for fish, the lower you eat on the food chain, the less likely that it's going to have pollutants and heavy metals accumulate. So mackerel sardines, and even like shellfish, like uh, shrimp is great. Um, and then I don't eat a whole lot of chicken, but I do eat turkey. And there's like a source of turkey that I get that are just kind of like wild, you know, turkey. And I, I buy a lot of it when I can. And I have one of those chest freezers. So whenever I see a deal, I fill that up. And so, but I think, uh, and eggs too are great with a, with a ketogenic diet um, and we don't have chickens, but our neighbors do, and <laughs> and he has more eggs than he can use. So we get uh, and the quality of the types of fats in the egg yolk will be will be highly influenced by what you feed your chickens. So that that's an important thing to remember. Mm. Okay, we have time for one more here. An excellent talk, Tom. Um, so let's say that you have a couple of neighbors and they say, boy, you guys are looking good, what are you doing? You say, oh, I'm doing keto diet, I'm in the sunshine, I'm exercising, lowering my stress, blah, blah, blah. And they say, yeah, but I, I can sit on the couch, eat potato chips, drink Coke, have three glasses of wine at night because I heard this guy, Dr. Decasino, say, yeah, I just gotta take these ketones and I'm as good as you guys. How, how would you respond yeah. to such yeah. a neighbor? <laughs> Well, if you listened to the talk, you knew that two or three glasses of wine at nighttime would not be good. Uh, well, I'll say this. I was skeptical of the idea that you could replace the ketogenic diet with exogenous ketones and get a benefit. And someone who convinced me otherwise was the late Dr. Richard Veach, who's probably been talked about here. Uh, there was actually a ceremonial like, uh, talk uh, lecture for him today. So he was at the National Institutes of Health. He was also mentored by Hans Krebs of the Krebs Cycle. He's very knowledgeable and one of my early mentors that got me into this. And uh, he was not in favor of a high-fat ketogenic diet because he thought that could increase your heart disease risk. I would argue with him there. Uh, depends on how the diet's formulated and the particular person. But what he sold me on this idea that you could eat any diet, consume exogenous ketones, elevate your ketones, and then those ketones would not only give your brain a superior source of energy, but was also like a hormone-like molecule that could activate anti-inflammatory pathways. It could change neurotransmitter systems in your brain. I was very skeptical of that because I was under the opinion, I followed Jeff Volick and Stephen Finney, that this keto adaptation, you're, you had to shift your metabolism to then get the benefits. And that was a time-dependent process. However, like we did, we formulate, uh, the first ketone ester that we tried was actually <laughs> Dr. Veach's ester and it did not have an anti-seizure effect, but we formulated another ester in our particular scenario that elevated beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. And then that administered 30 minutes prior to the seizure producing uh, oxidative environment, like had amazing anti-seizure effects. And that was, the animals were eating just standard rat chow. So we did that, and then also when we administer exogenous ketones, we see glucose goes down. And it goes down more than like using metformin, for example. So, and then we saw that it activated, uh, had anti-cancer anti effects. <laughs> you know, even in a Petri dish, we moved it to a mouse model, and we published another, uh, you know, publications on that. And another study, my role in the study was formulating the diet. It was conducted at Yale University uh, where the exogenous ketones were put into a standard diet and it, it suppressed something called the NLRP3 inflammasome. And when that gets activated, the inflammatory cytokines go up. And, uh, and that was a clear demonstration. It was published in Nature Medicine and it was, you know, the title is beta hydroxybutyrate, you know, reduces the NLRP3 inflammasome. That's also further indication that these ketones operate independent of carbohydrate restriction, and they can in and of themselves have some pretty profound effects. 
That said, the ketogenic diet has its own you know, benefits to it, and exogenous ketones have their own benefits, but it's overlapping. So, but I think it's not one or the other, but it, our sort of direction is to use them together in the optimal metabolic therapy, in the context of seizures, cancer, and, and the things. Higher ketone levels are not always better too. So as, and that's an important concept I didn't talk about, but if your ketone levels get up to four, five, and six, that could create energy toxicity. So I am of the opinion of using a more moderate exogenous ketone, like a ketone electrolyte salt, like KetoStart, just to bump you up about one millimolar. Because once you get up to two, three, and four, then that's too much energy for the body. It's like we're not trying to get higher glucose levels, right? <laughs> so I think it's important to just moderately boost up ketones within safe ranges. And I think ketone esters and those things can have... We've seen it in our animal models where they can become sick very quick and even die if we get ketones too high. So I think that's a, like an important lesson um, that higher is not always better with the ketones. You know. So I know you all, there's other questions out here, but we have to close this out right now. Um, but I know that Dom would welcome uh, questions to his website. Or uh, where? Yeah, or I'm pretty searchable of my, you know. Yeah, or searchable. Or you can, he's all over Google when you Google him, so you can get to him easily. So um, thank you again, Dom. It was fantastic to have you here. Thank you.